Good morning, Jay. I'm glad to see you celebrating Memorial Day. You know, as the as the greatest generation begins to die off naturally on us, there's fewer and fewer people alive today that know really what it's like to to get that call or to learn that they had lost a loved one in a war. You know, in the last, tw uh, you know, I'm 41, and you know, I, we've really never experienced a real war since 1975, since the end of the Vietnam War. There have only been 7,000 casualties of, uh, I mean, deaths that have taken place in war, but the, the previous 58 years to that, there were 636,000 American lives lost in war. And so you can imagine the huge cultural shift, the whole uh, worldview outlook has really changed in the last, oh, yeah. in the last 30 years. I, I went to college during the 70s, and the Vietnam War was raging. Life magazine created a huge controversy by publishing the photographs, uh, the headshots of each of the soldiers who had died in Vietnam the previous week. And people thought that this was an anti-war statement. And Life magazine was saying, well, uh, not really. This is what uh, this war is all about. And number one, I recall the controversy, but I recall just the bitter reality of seeing the pictures of these folks. Uh, I routinely was hearing stories about people from my high school who were in the war, and now and then we would hear stories about our friends who had died. So as everybody gets older, war becomes a, a much uh, a sobering experience. Well, you're absolutely right. Freedom is not free, and uh, you know we can lose freedom in a generation, as Reagan reminded us, if we don't fight for it and pass it on and teach it to our, our to our next generation. And that's really the the charge of any generation of every generation. And of course, when Russell was approached in in '57 by Henry Regnery to write the American Cause, this book that that you uh, rightfully mentioned is the reason why we fight. You know, Russell at first was really reluctant to write it to, you know, take away from his time that, uh, you know, he was doing in follow-up to the, the great success of his masterstroke conservative mind. But when Russell learned that uh, the American GIs that had been captured, POWs, by, in, in the Korean War were, were easy targets for communist indoctrination, Russell took up the pen in defense of the American cause. These GIs just did not know what they were fighting for. They weren't able to articulate what it was that was the American idea, what they were fighting for. And <laughs> nature, nature hates a vacuum, and, and that's true even of, of human nature. So if a man does not have a set of principles, then they're likely to be replaced by some, some armed ideology, and that's what was happening, and that's why Russell picked, uh, took up the pen and wrote this outstanding, outstanding book that really is a, a treasure to those who have it. And now what, did, what were the base, basic points he made? Well, in the book, Russell's, Russell starts off by, it's interesting, he says, in a second paragraph, he says that many Americans are badly prepared for the task of defending their own conviction and interests and in institutions against the grim threat of armed ideology. The propaganda of radical ideologues sometimes confuses and weakens the will of well-intentioned Americans who lack any clear understanding of their own nation's first principles. And in our age, good-natured ignorance is a luxury none of us can afford. So in the book, he really does a great job. You know, Russell Kirk's, a lot of his writings are uh, sometimes difficult. They're over the head of a lot of folks. But this is a book that he really geared for that, uh, you know, that uh, the, the high school student and the GI mind. But he really he lays out not only the system of moral beliefs, the system of economic beliefs, how our government is structured so that way, no one man uh, can, uh, can abuse the power, how it is balanced, how the powers are separated and clearly defined. But then he talks about the American achievement. And uh, then in one chapter that is absolutely brilliant, and, you know, Russell has such a sparkling prose. And in this book particularly, uh, you know, he really, you can really see the, the love in his, in his words for his country. But then he, in one chapter, he actually goes after and, and, and just completely devastates each of these anti-American arguments as well and so it's really a great handbook for you know today so often the the republican activists or the tea party activists don't know who russell kirk is even though the big shots the conservative big shots and bookworms from all over the world respect him as one of the intellectual lions this is really a book that uh is is really something that conservatives can really sink their teeth into let me let me remind everybody, uh, we are on the American Dream talk show on WHAM 1600, and we're talking about uh, Memorial Day with Darren Moore, uh, the book, The American Cause, uh, how that book was intended to challenge 
say, the general, uh, I don't want, well, ignorance of a great many of us, and just lay out the principle, the first principles of what America is all about. Russell makes this one point that liking America much as they found it, our founders uh, overturned English rule chiefly so that way they could simply preserve justice and order and freedom that the American colonies, colonies had long enjoyed. It was an extension of this whole cultural chain of Western civilization that, that our founders were in, intending that stretches back through England, through Rome, Athens, and Jerusalem. And the American Revolution was actually an attempt at solidifying the three cardinal ideas of Western politics, which Russell points out is uh, a just and ordered liberty. You know, Russell spent a lot of time in his life talking about the, f the, the key, the first, the first uh, uh, prerequisite to a civilization is order, because without order, you're not going to be able to enforce justice, and without order, man will not have freedom. So justice, order, and freedom were the three cardinal virtues, the three cardinal ideas of Western civilization, and Russell really out, uh, outlines each one of those beautifully in this book. Now, what was the reaction? Well, I think they're on the seventh printing, <laughs> so it, it went really, really well. You know, a lot of folks that uh, that, that looked at this, I mean, Regnery was really excited about the, the initial response of the book, but what is interesting is, you know, Russell is a Michigan man, and we're so fortunate to have so many great institutions and, and great Kirkian scholars, one of which is Gleaves Whitney, who is the head of the Howenstein Center over in Grand, Grand Valley State University, who wrote a wonderful new introduction to this book, as well as an afterthought, after the attacks of 9-11. So Gleaves went in and, and really updated this book for the post-9-11 world, because, you know, the armed ideology that we were fighting prior to 9-11 was, was a communism, a socialism, a collectivism that uh, had a, a top-down style of management as opposed to our bottom-up elected republic, the small r republicanism that we have here in America. And so when 9-11 when came, uh, you know, Gleaves realized that this book was as, uh, as, as prudent and as important today as it was when Russell wrote it some 50 years ago. He really does uh, the job of a distillation in this book. I mean, it's only 143 pages, and in one chapter, he talks about political principles, the Federal Republic. And so, you know, he talks about the judicial power and, and the great contributions of men like uh, Chief Justice John Marshall and, and uh, the executive power and how, how these powers, um, you know, as we talked once on your show before, that the, the, the real uh, cause of or the, the real influence of our government that our founders tried to balance properly is the drive uh, of jealousy, the drive of envy in that, each of the each of the various um, um, branches of government kind of leaned on each other like a teepee, and that whole, held up the whole system. And if we knew that the judicial power would jealously guard its power against the legislative and the legislative against the executive, each of these three branches would would end up supporting each other and balancing each other. But also by uh, by enumerating powers to the federal government and then giving all the rest of the states the idea of subsidiarity, the idea of of states as the laboratories of democracy, so that way there would be best practices able to be replicated in 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 the pursuit of a more perfect. Now, union. do you think do you think America is uh, at least from the intellectual side of things? Do you think Americans have a better understanding of these first principles today than back then? Because I go back yeah. and forth on this. I I see. I see. First of all, uh, politics is, is uh, a lagging indicator. It, it, politics is, is not what's moving the country forward. It's sort of uh, politics follows what's going on in, in the culture. I go back and forth. I think the Internet has changed things significantly. A lot of people are getting information. We can't rely, we can't expect that what people see in you know, the mainstream media is what, e quote unquote, everybody believes. Well, you know, Jay, I hate to say it, but I, I don't think that uh, the, the average American man has a, a sense of, of, his, his, of his founding principles, of the first principles. I don't think that, and I think that often we see this in this confusion of the political movements. You know, you're absolutely right that the politician is, is the product. It's the manifestation of political ideas that are first brought to, to the public by the philosopher, the pamphleteers, you know, they create this greater seabed for these ideas. But when you look at, and Russell makes this point. Wait, wait, uh, we're coming up, we have about a minute and a half before we end. Oh. Yeah. Well, 
You know, I, I think that we need to we need to really look at our, our first principles, and I, of course, that's what our organization, the New Centurions Program, is is really designed to do is to recover these first principles in a in a in a deep way. But you know, Jay, before I leave you, I've got to I've got to read the the last two paragraphs of this outstanding book on on uh, on Memorial Day weekend because I think they really go to the heart. Of, of what we're celebrating here. You know, America is... You know, I'm don't do it. We got, we, they're going to cut us off without... Oh, uh, mercilessly right. cut us off, yeah. Gotcha. Well, well, Jay, perhaps uh, the readers can simply grab their own copy of the ISI-published American Cause and have it there on their, their table. It's great for kids. It's great for the adults. And even guys like me love going back to this book from time to time to really, to really steep myself again in the American Cause and its traditions. Okay. Darren, uh, thanks for uh, calling. We appreciate it. Uh, I will post those paragraphs on the, uh, on the internet, uh, on my website. America is a great nation, and if she is not invariably guided by exalted justice and benevolence, still surely she is playing her part among the nations with some courage and generosity for two important reasons and those of equal weight in the minds of most citizens of the United States. America has set her face against every totalist ideology stationed her troops on foreign soil, built an immense air force and an immense fleet, poured out her national wealth in aid of the defense and the welfare of the free world. One reason is that Americans believe in the dignity of man, made in the image more than human, and the revolutionary ideologue threatens to destroy that dignity wherever he finds weakness. The other reason is that Americans know that they themselves cannot be secure unless the civilization of which they are part is secure. They do not hesitate to oppose by strength the armed doctrines of ideologues. Their cause, they believe, is the cause of true human nature, of enlightened order, regular justice, and liberty under the law. For this cause they have made some sacrifices. They will make more. Americans do not aspire to make this world into one vast uniform United States, for they cherish diversity at home and abroad. That our elaborate civilization and our delicate civil social order may not fall victims to the revolutionary movements at home and abroad, this is the end to which American policy is directed. And if Americans have valor in them still, theirs will not be a losing cause.